Well, happy Father's Day to all my fellow fathers in the room. Happy Father's Day. For me, it's really just the final round of the U.S. Open. I'm a big golf fan. That's all that really matters on Father's Day. I'm just kidding. But happy Father's Day. Um, we're so glad that you're sharing part of your Father's Day with us. And, you know, because it's Father's Day, I thought it would be appropriate to do a real dad thing. Share some high school sports stories with you, you know. Yeah, I'm going to be that guy for a little bit. You know, exaggerate how good I actually was in high school. You know, all you dads, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I played, I used to slam it down and dunk it and score five touchdowns. No, you didn't. We look up your stats, okay? <laughs> Ever hear the quote, distance lends enchantment to the view? Yeah. Dads, as we get older, our high school sports careers become more and more prolific, right? Like, you know, you get older, you're great. I was a track athlete. And I ran the 800, the half mile. Two laps, if you don't know anything about track. And this isn't an exaggeration. If you talk to a track guru, they will tell you that the 800 is the hardest event in track. It just is. It's not quite a distance event, so you can't like get into a rhythm. But it's, it's not a sprint either because it's, it's so long. So it's, it's really hard. And I'm not trying to be that guy. But I was pretty good, okay? I was. Look, the clock doesn't lie, okay? That's the good thing about track. You know, you can always be like, yeah, I was really good at basketball. Like, you scored four points a game, okay? You weren't that good. But the clock doesn't lie. I was, I was pretty good. There's documented proof that I could run an 800 in just a little over two minutes, 202. It's a really good time. It is. By the way, I still hold my high school record for the 4x800 meter relay. I do. I go to Chestnut Ridge High School, look it up, I'm on the wall. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, very humble. So, <laughs> I used to run the first lap in about 57 or 58 seconds. Let me tell you a little bit about my strategy, okay? And then I come around the turn and I stride it down the back stretch. And then that last 200 meters, the last turn and the last front stretch, right? That's what separates the men from the boys. That's it. The last 200 meters of an 800 is brutal. Your muscles start to lock up. You can't breathe right. And the pressure's on to finish. I had this track coach. His name is Coach Iguli. He's like about this tall, but one of the most intense guys I've ever known. And he'd always stand at the last turn, and he'd yell at me and say, don't look back, don't look back, don't look back. And it was because he wanted me to finish it, finish well. You know, some, some races, I would, I would be out ahead of everybody, I'd smoke everybody, okay? And he would be like, Finish it, don't look back, finish it, don't look back. I'd be like, really, dude? I'm like 10 seconds ahead. But I did anyway. And some races, it, would, it was evident that I just wasn't gonna win. You know, there was this kid I ran against. His name was Jordan Donaldson. He beat me every time. I have like a, all these second place medals because of this guy. Not bitter or anything, but anyway. Even if I was still pretty far behind, my coach would still say, finish it, don't look back, finish it. And I never really understood why. You know, what's, what's the big deal? I'm gonna win, I'm gonna lose. What's the big deal with always trying to finish it well? Well, listen, finishing was important in the 800, but it's even more important in life. How you finish it. Turn to someone and say, Finish it, finish it. That's the title of the message today. We're gonna finish it. If you're joining us today for the first time, we're in a series called Build It Back and it's based on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So this is the second message in that series. And last week, we learned about this guy named Cyrus. He was the king of Persia. And he issued a decree that allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem. Previously, they were taken into captivity by Babylon, 
okay? But Cyrus, king of Persia, allowed them to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of the Lord. We read this last week, Ezra chapter one, two to three. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, today, as we pick up the story in Ezra chapter three, these Israelites are beginning the work of rebuilding the house of the Lord after they made this journey back to Jerusalem. We talked about that a little bit last week. So if you look in your Bibles at Ezra chapter three, you'll see that they rebuild the altar in verses one through seven. And then they begin the work of rebuilding the temple by laying its foundation in verses eight through 11. So we're gonna enter the story today when the foundation of the temple is being laid, okay? So, Ezra 3, verse 11. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. I'd like to, you know, keep it interactive. So turn to someone and say, was it really that great? Is it really that great? Husbands, turn to your wives and say, was I really that great? No, don't do that. (laughs) Don't give her an opening. (laughs) Man, come on. I was that great. Still am. It's Father's Day. I can say that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not necessarily talking about people. Was it really that great? Here's what I mean. When the foundation of the temple is laid in Ezra chapter three, there's a mixed reaction. We just read about it, right? Many shouted aloud for joy. Wow, what an amazing thing this is. But those who remembered the first temple, what did they do? They wept. Instead of rejoicing in what God was doing in the present, they were stuck on what was. We tend to exaggerate past blessings and undervalue present blessings, don't we? Distance lends enchantment to the view. I'd like to ask these guys who wept, go back in time and ask them, was it really that great? Here's what I mean. I'm not trying to take away from Solomon, right? He was an incredibly wise man. He accomplished much. He was a Christ type. No one could ever deny the beauty and majesty of Solomon's temple, right? You can read about it to this day. It was one of the most extravagant structures ever built that mankind ever knew. It was an incredible accomplishment that he built that. It was a testament to Israel's prominence and wealth in that day. But listen, watch. Have you ever thought about this? What did it actually accomplish? If you look back on the history of it, was it really that great? Solomon dedicates the temple in 1 Kings chapter eight, okay? And by 1 Kings chapter 11, if you look, usually the heading of the chapter is Solomon turns away from the Lord. Just a few chapters later. And if you keep going, you'll read about a couple guys named Rehoboam and Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12. Israel ends up divided. 
And all of this happens after this incredible temple was built. Was it really that great? Depends how you define great, doesn't it? Was it really that great? Listen, no matter how great I thought something was, and there have been great things, but no matter how great I thought something was, I choose to believe that the best is always yet to come. Always. There are always far, far better things ahead than any that we leave behind. And yes, we leave behind some great things, but the best is yet to come. This is just one example. Hopefully I don't upset anybody, but oh well. I think many of us are often tempted to look back on recent, recent church history and believe that it used to be better back then. You ever hear that right? More people went to church back then. Our society was more religious back then. People were just more serious about their faith back then. But was it really that great? Why did more people go to church back then? Could it be that maybe church was in large part simply where social gatherings took place in that time? So that's really why people went? Maybe society was more religious back then. But is being religious a good thing? Were people more serious about their faith back then? Or were they actually just really legalistic? Was it really that great? There have been great things in the history of the church, amazing things, both past and recently. I'm not saying that they're not great, but listen, if Christ is the head of the church, and if Christ builds its church, and as long as we can sing, Jesus, build your church, I'm believing that the best days of the church are in front of us, not behind us. It's ahead. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, verse 10. It says, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. The prophet Zechariah prophesied to the Israelites during this time. He actually addresses those who wept in Ezra chapter 3 because of the foundation of the new temple. And look what he says, Zechariah 4, verses nine through 10. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Look, for whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Listen, the foundation may start small. So small it's discouraging. So small you may think it doesn't have a chance. So small you think it would never live up to expectations. But look at the end of verse 10. His eyes are upon it and you will rejoice. It may start small, but God often chooses the small things to bring about mighty things. Who else could accomplish it from the small to the mighty? I may only have seven loaves of bread and a few small fish, but if the eyes of the Lord are upon it, I can feed 5,000. Oh, now, is that not a cool thing or what? I need some more reaction than that. Seven loaves and a few small fish and he fed 5,000. Come on. God starts with the small things to bring about mighty things. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. 
But when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. In your life, don't be discouraged with the small things. Be faithful in the small things. He who is faithful in the small things will be faithful in much. Let's keep going. Ezra chapter four now, verses one through four. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, let us build with you for we worship your God as you do and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of whatever his name is, king of Assyria who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, you know, if, if they wanted us pastors to like preach their names, they should have made them easier names to pronounce in the first place. I mean, I mean John, Paul, that's what I'm talking about. You know, <laughs> Esther Haddon, I guess, I, I don't know. Anyway, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. The King James Version of verse four reads this way, I like it. It says, then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So what we have here is the people of the land didn't get their way. So we read verses one through three. They wanted to help build the temple with the Israelites. But they wanted to help for political reasons. They wanted influence. Their reasons to help build the temple had nothing to do with the vision and mission that Zerubbabel and Jeshua had, even though they said it did. God has a calling on your life. He's given you vision. He's given you a mission to build his kingdom in a unique way. But watch, are you allowing others to build it with you when they actually don't support the vision, mission, and calling that you have? Are those who are surrounding you actually supporting you in what you're called to do, or are they holding you back? They may say they're with you, yeah, we support you, yeah, we're friends, but are they just actually weakening your hands? You have things that God has called you to do. God speaks to you, he places things on your heart to build his kingdom in a unique way. And even if you don't know what those things are all the time, listen, you know what they're not. So are the people that are surrounding you weakening your hands? Maybe you should surround yourself with people who strengthen your hands. Because we have a job to do. And God wants to do it through us. We started our time in Ezra chapter three with the foundation of the temple being laid. By the end of Ezra three, there's people already weeping about it. <laughs> in Ezra four, the people of the land now start to discourage the Israelites. And by the end of Ezra chapter four, didn't take long, look at verse 24. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, just a side note, if you're like organized like me, Ezra 4 isn't written in a chronological sense, okay? It's written thematically and just details a lot of the opposition that the Israelites faced both now and in the future. So you may wanna put brackets around verses six to 23, if you wanna stay in the chronological, okay? All that other stuff happens later. But anyway, by verse 24, 
the work of the house of the of the house of God stopped. Have you put what God has called you to do on the back burner? Has the work on the house of God stopped in your life? The work on the house of the Lord stopped. But enter Haggai and Zechariah. Look at Ezra 5.1. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So just as Haggai and Zechariah had a message for the Israelites, I'm praying that they also have a message for you today. We already heard a bit from Zechariah about not despising the small things, right? Don't despise the small, the foundation of the house. Let's look at what Haggai said now as the work of the house of God stopped. Now, hey, just real quick, you know it's a legit sermon when you're looking at Haggai, you know. <laughs> Tell all your friends today, hey, this guy preached on Haggai. What? Oh, man, <laughs> Haggai. Anyway. Haggai 1.3, okay, look. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? In other words, Haggai shows up and he says, what are you guys doing? Why'd you stop rebuilding? It's not time to stop. Now, every word of scripture is important. Why does it specifically say paneled houses? Look, paneling was something that was used on royal dwellings. Solomon's temple was actually paneled with cedar. It says they were dwelling in paneled houses. So look, it's likely that they began to use the materials that they were supposed to use on the rebuilding of the temple and then they started using them to rebuild their own houses. Has the work on the house of the Lord stopped in your life because you're using what God gave you to build his kingdom and you're just using them to build your own? Mm. God has given you time. He's given you resources. He's given you talent. He's given you influence in your workplaces, in your communities, in your families. I believe that God has placed you right where he wants you for such a time as this. And you're not placed there to build your own paneled houses. You're there to build his church. I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. Are you walking in them? Or are you building your own kingdom? Has the work on the house of God stopped in your life. Look at Haggai 1, 5 to 6. Now we're going to identify with this one. He says, consider your ways. You have sown much, but you harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Haggai is asking, are those paneled houses really that great? Is it really great to build your own kingdom? I know I've tried, still do sometimes. It's not that great. My own kingdom kind of stinks. There's nothing exciting about it. If we spend our lives building our own houses, we're gonna be dreadfully disappointed. 
always discontent, will never be satisfied, always thirsty. But the good news is he already gave you the recipe for satisfaction and contentment. If you want a purpose, he gave it to you. You don't need to find it. Haggai 1.7, he reminds them of their purpose. He says, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Every person here is called to build his house in a unique way. But we're all called to build the house. That's the mission we all share. Go, make disciples of all nations. That's the recipe for finding purpose in your life. Has the work on the house of the Lord stopped in your life? Verse nine, you looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins. While each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. If you have a lack of concern for building the house of God, when you neglect the calling that God has placed on your heart, you won't receive the blessings that God has for you. He withholds the due. We urge you every week, we say, live to reach all people with nothing but Jesus. And that just comes from the Great Commission. We're commanded to do it. That's what Jesus said. Go, make disciples, baptizing them. That's what he said. But listen, we also urge you to do that because we believe that's the only thing that can give you true meaning and purpose in life. To live for something bigger than your own kingdom. And there's nothing bigger to live for than the kingdom of God. It will never fail. Paul, he got it. He said in Acts 20, he said, I consider myself, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Has the work on the house of God stopped in your life? Are you living to complete the task that God has given you. When the building stopped, Haggai and Zechariah came to urge these people to finish it. And look what happens next. Verse two. Then Zerubbabel, the son of his dad, okay, it's Father's Day, and Jeshua, the son of his dad, <laughs> arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. They arose again to rebuild. So after they hear from Haggai and Zechariah, they arose, they began to rebuild, and then look what happens in Ezra chapter six, verse 14. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Antaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. They finished it. Haggai and Zechariah came to urge these people, hey, finish it. You know what? It would be real easy 
to end the message with that. Hey, come on, people. Finish it. Because it is true. God calls us to finish it. The Israelites returned to Jerusalem to build it back, but they lost their way. So Haggai and Zechariah needed to urge them to finish it. And that's a real easy message to preach. Finish it. God's calling you. He's calling our church to finish what he's called you to do, to live out your calling to the fullest and finish it. You know, live a life where at the end you can say with Paul, I fought the good fight of the faith. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finish it. But shout out to my friend, Jim Powell. He always quotes this. It's not his quote. Okay, Jim, don't get your head too big. It comes from the Psalms. He always says, unless the Lord builds the house, then those who build it labor in vain. God is calling you to finish it, but without properly understanding why you build and how you finish it, you'll be right back to Ezra 4, 24. And the house of the Lord, the work on the house of the Lord stopped. A proper understanding of why you build and how you finish it comes from looking deeply at the message Haggai and Zechariah really gave. They didn't come to give a rah-rah speech. You know, I'm, I'm not a motivational speaker up here like, yeah, come on, we're gonna do it. You know, I'm not that good, okay? It wasn't a rah-rah speech. It wasn't just motivational speaking. That actually doesn't work. Maybe for a few days, but it doesn't work. The Israelites rose up and continued to build it back. Because Haggai and Zechariah, they painted a picture of a temple that man wouldn't be tasked with finishing, but that God would finish himself. They showed the Israelites that by them building it back, they were pointing to a greater temple. Whereas Zechariah said, God will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. They built it back because they believed and they saw the vision that Haggai and Zechariah had that they were building it back to point to something greater than just a building. They believed that God would actually then truly finish the temple. And I get to tell you today that he did. John chapter two. Destroy this temple, Jesus answered. And in three days, I will build it again. The leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think you can rebuild it in three days. But Jesus was talking about his body as a temple. And when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered what he had told them. Then they believed the scriptures and the words of Jesus. In Matthew 12, he says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. The temple was just a foreshadow of what was to come. It pointed to the true temple, Jesus. Jesus is the temple where you go to meet with God. There is but one mediator between God and man. It's Jesus. Jesus finished it. He finished the temple. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. I am the temple. The temple was finished 
in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And here's the real glorious thing. It's present here today through us. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you, the church? We are the temple of God. He's given his spirit to us. The temple is finished. It's right here in this place right here. I said the message was called, finish it. But there's no real hope in that. That's just a motivational speech. You can't live out of finish it. You know what you do live out of though? He already did finish it. And we get to stand upon the finished work of Jesus. And we build his church on what is already finished. Though his kingdom is not fully realized yet, it is here. We call it the already, but not yet. But we're a reflection of that great thing that is to come. That day in Revelation, it actually says there will be no temple because we will dwell with him right with him and we will be his people and he will be our God. The real message today is that he already finished it. And so as you live out your calling, as you go through life, as you walk in what he already has for you and as you and our church, as we build it back, we know that we can always finish it because he already did. It's finished. That's the hope that we have. The hope we have is that it's finished. Not that we have to do things. It's that it's already done. Haggai, he says in chapter two, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And look, the latter glory of this house, Jesus, shall be greater than the former. This house is greater than anything that was. And in this place, he says, I will give peace. In this place, I will give peace. And Paul wrote in Romans chapter five, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already have it. Peace is ours. So the message I have for you today is that no matter how much your life lies in ruins, no matter how bad you're broken, no matter how beyond repair that you think you are, He can build it back. He restores and he rebuilds. And as a matter of fact, it gets even better. He already finished it. It's here. Whatever you seek, it's here. Peace is here. In this place, this place, I will give peace. In this place, and in this place. Peace with God, peace in our hearts, peace in every situation. 
peace is here because he is here. The Lord, he's in this place. The Lord is in this place. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid because the Lord is in this place. He is our strength. He is our refuge in times of trouble. And He, and only He, is our peace. So will you ask Him today to rebuild what is broken in your life? What is? Is your life filled with chaos? Will you be honest with yourselves for just a few minutes? Where in your life is lacking peace? He can rebuild and he can restore. We serve a God that is not far off, but who is present and dwells. want to set an atmosphere that sometimes you know you listen to a sermon and you're like that was great and you walk out and you go about your business but can we take just a few more minutes to really grasp this because this is so important he can rebuild what is broken in your life it's finished you don't have to finish it all you have to do is to claim the peace that was already bought for you in Jesus. So we wanna give you just a few minutes to respond. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe your life is filled with chaos because of that. Will you know today that God is the rebuilder of your life? that he can take what is broken and change your life in ways you could never imagine. You're here today for a reason. If you need to respond, stand, come up, kneel, pray, but respond to the peace that he gives you. And remember, the place where we are today is holy ground because he is here. His presence dwells here in this 